Well, I certainly hope it doesn't come to this, but if Missouri football disappoints in 2024, there's an obvious scapegoat, and I'll tell you who it is right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso, and a man who's backing the field as of right now against the Boston Celtics. But of course, this is a Mizzou a Tigers basketball and football show. I want to talk today about why Mizzou basketball needs to look a little bit different than it has the first couple years under Dennis Gates and why some freshmen on that squad are absolutely going to have to contribute but let's start on the football field. Just a ton of names, of course, thrown around on this program on t- in terms of football and basketball. And I do want to sort of give you a recap as we go along here in this program. But when it comes to Mizzou football specifically, obviously there are questions on every roster in the SEC and in the nation, but there are questions and there are And then there are questions in massive, big, bold letters, sort of like Lionel Hutz on The Simpsons said one time. He said, there's the truth and the truth. In other words, well, there's the kind of lying truth. (laughs) But anyway, the point is there is a difference here between things that are just simply unknowns and simply things that are massive questions. And fortunately, Missouri doesn't have that many of the latter at this point in terms of massive questions. Roster-wise, as I've said before, corner is my biggest question mark. But if the South for the Tigers this season, there's really only one person who is the scapegoat. There's really no doubt who it's going to be, and that person is new defensive coordinator Corey Batoon. And the fact that most of the pressure is really going to be on Coach Batoon this season is not fair, especially after, well, Blake Baker made the lateral move to LSU this offseason. I I just don't think it's totally fair for all of it to be on Batoon. There's a a lot of new personnel there and things that can go wrong beyond the defensive coordinator's control. And I think we as we as fans have a tendency to blame coordinators for everything when their particular side of the ball starts to go wrong. But seriously, though, the lateral move jokes and pointing of the Bayou Bengals aside, Baker was obviously really good for Missouri and coaching absolutely matters a lot, especially the higher you go up. In, in football, in my opinion, and the only higher level than the SEC really is the NFL at this point. So he's absolutely set up. He being Corey Batoon is set up to be the fall guy this season if it goes wrong. I'm not sure if that's fair or not, but he has a lot of pressure on his back right now. And just to start the recap of the offseason for Missouri football, of course, it isn't just cornerback where Missouri has some real questions. Of course, Ennis Rakestraw drafted in the second round by the Detroit Lions. Ennis Rakestraw drafted by the Denver Broncos as well. That means that there's a lot of pressure on Toriano Pride, who transferred in from Clemson as well, a former East St. Louis product. Just a lot of interesting question marks on defense versus on offense where you've basically got, you've got everybody back other than Co- Cody Schrader at running back and a couple of a couple of spots on the offensive line where you've got some transfers including Oklahoma product Caden Green. You expect to be able to just plug and play if you're Missouri. So offensively, I can't think of any major serious questions that I have on that side of the ball. Punter is certainly a question mark, no doubt about that, but Missouri has survived Certainly, I would say average to mediocre punting here the last couple years. 
Blake Craig, of course, in for Harrison Mevis in terms of place kicking is a big change as well, though so far so good it would seem for Blake Craig. Missouri never bothered to even kick the tires on any other kickers in the transfer portal, at least to my knowledge. No visits, anything like that. Obviously, they didn't bring anybody in at that position, but just their lack of activity there tells me that Missouri feels pretty good about where there is at this point. Now, at punt returner, Luther Burden still going to be your main guy, especially in big spots. But I do expect Marquise Johnson to get a good bit of action there and at the kickoff return spot as well. And, of course, I expect Marquise to be a big-time player at the receiver position as well. So, again, all of this just sets up to a Missouri offense that should be one of the top 10 units in the country, but frankly, a Missouri defense that also sets up to be projected at least. You look at the best numbers out there, a top 20, 25 type unit, at least on paper, but to me with so many different variables, including at corner, including at at defensive line, where of course Darius Robinson was a first round pick, Jaden Jernigan, Josh Landry, and others have moved on. Of course, Johnny Walker, one of the Cotton Bowl MVPs, is back on the defensive line. Still, again, to me, with the other variable being a a couple new coaches as well. Of course, the most important one being the defensive coordinator. Just a lot of variables there to absolutely say that, oh, this is going to be a top 25 type defense, in my opinion. Not trying to be Debbie Down or anything like that. I'm just trying to be a realist at this point. Now, linebacker is one spot I haven't spent a ton of time talking about here, but Corey Flagg from the University of Miami, also a significant addition there. Also, Chuck Hicks, interestingly, got a medical waiver for his seventh year of college football And frankly, this has become such a common occurrence at this point. Certainly the free COVID year has a lot to do with a seventh year for Chuck Hicks here. But at a certain point, if players are getting paid millions of dollars, quite literally, if the if the Jaden Rashada lawsuit being filed against Billy Napier and Florida boosters over NIL payments, if any of that is even remotely accurate, this is getting awfully close to NFL and certainly professional football at this point. So that does call into question, why do we even have a four-year limit for how long you can play college football? If at this point we're just turning the entire sport upside down for the most part, it is it wor- it is worth at least asking the question, well, why can't guys, maybe just certain guys who are – studs and could be great quarterbacks, for example, at the college level, but aren't quite NFL players. Think maybe Stetson Bennett, for example, from Georgia, even our own Chase Daniel or James Franklin or Drew Locke or somebody like that. Somebody who maybe isn't quite NFL starter caliber at the very least, but hey, maybe in the SEC, you could actually make as good, if not better money than being an NFL backup. That certainly seems like that's plausible, again, considering the amount of money being thrown around, thrown around there in that Jaden Rashada lawsuit. Some of that stuff has been more or less confirmed and, and a lot of it thrown out there in terms of the big numbers in the process. Certainly not the first time it's been reported anyway. Let's put it that way. There's more than one sourcing on this stuff. So, again, if that's the case, maybe we should just let Brady Cook play quarterback at Missouri for the next 15 years. Would that completely ruin the sport? I don't know. Has it any more so than the traditions that we've already kind of turned upside down? Again, I'm not necessarily advocating that, just a little bit of a thought experiment here. And when it comes to Missouri basketball this coming season, the Tigers are certainly deep in terms of a lot of names and interesting names out there. But in terms of actual proven production, especially at the SEC and high major level, well, there's really only five guys that I can say are going to certainly be a regular part of the rotation. Part of this tells me that there's going to have to be at least one or two freshmen that are going to be big parts of not only the Missouri future, but also their present next season. So let's get back into hoops here coming up in just a little bit. 
But first, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And let's be honest, if you own a small business, you got into it to for your passion. You didn't necessarily get into it for the hiring process. Well, Leave it to the experts at LinkedIn Jobs, where it's not just any old regular job board. LinkedIn helps you find professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job at that moment, but they might be open to the perfect role. Is your job the perfect role? Let's find out over at LinkedIn Jobs. And LinkedIn Jobs knows that you're wearing so many hats, you might not have the time or resources to hire, so post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. By my count, Missouri has 14 guys on its basketball roster next season that I would say are, are scholarship caliber. Now, I believe 13 is technically the scholarship limit there. So how that all works out with name, image, and likeness and all that good stuff, well, that's sort of up for debate at this point. Now, there is one person I've now realized I've actually forgotten about. It's Caleb Grill, as I have just was saying, saying my – my piece there at the top of the show. So really it's 15 guys, but at the same time, if you include grill there, I think of those 15 guys, there's really only six that I would say are surefire rotation guys next next season. I mean, regular rotation guys. And that would be of course, Tamar Bates and Caleb grill, two of the returners from last season. And really as far as returners, that's it. As far as guys, I would guarantee are going to be getting regular action each and every game that they're available and healthy. Other than that, you're talking Tony Perkins at point guard, the Iowa transfer Marquez Warwick, the off guard from the Norse of Northern Kentucky. Also Jacob Cruz, another taller shooter from Tennessee Martin. And of course the headliner from the transfer class, a former Duke blue devil, Mark Mitchell. So that's six guys there who I can almost assure you are going to play quite a bit. Other than that, among guys who are either returners or at least have experience in, in college basketball, of course, I think Josh Gray, at the very least, with his size and rebounding prowess, at the very least, he's going to be a situational player for Missouri. But again, it's hard for me to say he's going to get regular rotation minutes every game because against certain opponents, I could see maybe the matchup just not being ideal for Josh Gray or perhaps just Dennis Gates and his staff choosing to go smaller and take advantage of what they think are better matchups. Also with Aiden Shaw, again, he, his minutes just bounced around an awful lot last season. His role bounced around a lot of bit and a, a, quite a bit. And also he's not a, a Dennis Gates recruit originally either. Anthony Robinson had his up, certainly was up and down last season. I thought started the season better, had some personal stuff off the court when his, when his grandmother passed during the season. So obviously a tough start for Anthony Robinson personally, that certainly could have factored into his, maybe his sort of freshman hitting the wall a little bit. Let's just say as the season went along, I felt like so Obviously, I think there's room for plenty of room for Anthony Robinson to grow. The point is, I don't think he's a sure thing. And same thing with Trent Pierce as well. So what does that tell you? You've got six guys and then really four guys that are question marks more or less. That tells me, especially when you look at the roster, that Anor Boateng, Marcus Allen, and really particularly Peyton Marshall on the post is going to have to give Missouri something this season. I think one of those three guys in particular is going to have to be a part of the regular rotation and give Missouri some good minutes in swing games that they need to win to be at least on the bubble of the tournament this season. Because while there's a lot of interesting names on this roster, 
Most of them have never really played together. And then on the back end, the last half of the roster, you've got a lot of question marks and guys with inexperience. So certainly you can bet probably all the money in the world that Missouri is not going to go 0-19 again next season. Improving beyond that is almost a guarantee, but the idea that Missouri is definitely going to be back next season, quote unquote, I think that's an open question. We're just going to have to see how this roster meshes together. And if you would have asked me after Dennis Gates first season, I'd have probably been a lot more confident just based on what I saw from his coaching staff up to that point. Now, of course, after last season's debacle, it's kind of hard to know what to believe. So if you have some faith or maybe no faith at all, it's kind of hard to argue against it either way at this point. And I've also had some recent comments here on YouTube that I would like to address, including Chris on YouTube, who actually had a good correction. I went back and looked at, well, who would make the college football playoff if there was a 12-teamer from last season, but not only based on last season, but based on last season on this season's conference setup, if that makes sense. So in other words, what I was trying to point out is that the fourth seed in this coming format is almost certainly going to be a surprising team, a team that maybe comes outside of the top 10 or even the top 15 or 20 of the final college football playoff rankings. And to my point, the Big 12 team from this past season, if you didn't include Texas and Oklahoma, would have been ranked a lot higher than fourth. Well, I said that would have been Oklahoma State, but as Chris correctly pointed out, no, actually that would have been Arizona. So you know what? You're 100% right, Chris. I, I blame these stupid new conferences and my, abil my inability to keep track of them to some extent, no, no doubt about that. So I forgot about the Arizona schools moving to the Big 12, I have to admit. But a good call by Chris, but I will say the point remains there because Arizona was definitely outside of the top 10, not a top four caliber team. But again, because these top four seeds are guaranteed in this coming format to the highest ranked conference champions, well, because the Big 12, excuse me, the Big 10 and the SEC are now so top loaded with the, the best programs traditionally in college football that's really there's really going to be an imbalance there in the top four so that's just something I wanted Mizzou fans and certainly college football fans in general to be aware of and be prepared for because that's just not a a talking point that I've seen brought up too much before but I guarantee you once the season starts and people start realizing this it's going to be a big time talking point so if you're a locked on Mizzou listener you can then brag and say you're ahead of the curve as per usual. And I got another YouTube comment recently that frankly made me laugh pretty hard, but also leaves me baffled about a week later. And that is somebody who is either acting to be offended about my usual intro of the program or they're just doing brilliant performance art. I, I'm truly not even sure at this point. I'm going to leave it up to you, the listener, to, the, to decide here in just a little bit. But you know what? Before we get there, I do want to talk about Yahoo Finance because I've been using Yahoo Finance, our sponsor today, for geez, just about 20 years now, almost. I'm a big time stock trader, futures guy. And to me, Yahoo Finance is one of the best resources out there. In fact, it's an absolutely incredible resource with not only stock charts that you can compare historically to any other company, any time period. You've also got, to me, the best news source and the easiest place to look up all of your quarterly results. I think that's about as good of a, of a resource as you can possibly get. And the fact that you can queue it all up in seconds, I mean, you want to talk about making people from the 1980s jealous. If I could hop into the DeLorean, I would do that right now. So here's the deal. With a community of over 90 million users each month, Yahoo Finance's real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor. 
yahoofinance.com. The number one financial destination. It's yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. So over years now on the Locked On Mizzou podcast, I've opened the show by saying, hey, I'm your Mizzou mafioso. Well, apparently this has gotten somebody's goat over in the YouTube comments, believe it or not. And I genuinely say believe it or not, because as I said, I'm not sure whether I believe this person is serious or not. You tell me. So this person says, what is a mafioso? Does your brand as a Mizzou specialist have anything to do with Italians, career criminals, or a crime network? No, nor does it have a humorous or good connotation. Sons and daughters is fine. Mafioso needs to be replaced with something more positive for the brand. Okay, then. So, by the way, the sons and daughters references when I say Hey, all you true sons and daughters. So apparently this person is a okay with that. So I'm glad they've really taken the time to break down my intro, my intro with a fine tooth comb. But to answer your first question, what is a mafioso? Well, the dictionary definition I would suppose would be somebody who's in the mafia, if you will, or hangs around those circles. But for this context, let me give it to you. The Mizzou Mafia, that is a phrase that is unique to the Missouri School of Journalism. It's basically a, you know, again, a it's supposed to be a humor, I, even though you seem to be without humor, or again, maybe this is just brilliant performance art. I'm not totally sure. Again, I'm still not 100% certain. It made me laugh either way. So either way, good job, I suppose. But again, for, if you, any of you are curious out there, Mizzou Mafia, it's basically, hey, I'll scratch my back and scratch yours if you're a former, if you're a J school person, it's kind of on you to help out the new graduates, that kind of thing, help them network, maybe get them a foot in the door at a place you work, that kind of deal. Give them a a letter of recommendation. That's really all it is. For example, when I was in college, Judy Bolch. Not only was she nice enough to be in the silly movie that I made in New York City, but while I was up there, she also introduced me to Seth Wickersham, who is one of the bigger sports writers, NFL writers out there, broke a lot of stuff with the New England Patriots over the last few years. So again, that's the type of thing that the Mizzou Mafia is. It's all just about networking and that kind of stuff. So just saying, instead of me saying, well, I graduated from the journalism school in 2005, I don't know, to me saying you're Mizzou mafioso, first of all, it's a lot less wordy. I do think it's more interesting, slightly humorous. Again, not saying I'm Chris Rock or anything like that, but yes, ladies and gentlemen, that was the point. So again, if that truly offended you, Number one, that's the most hilarious thing I've ever heard. Number two, if that's performance art and you're making fun of people who are easily offended, well, honestly, I'm still laughing. Well done. Maybe a little bit too dry. Maybe get something a little bit more satirical in there to to make your point. But other than that, I appreciate the effort. And finally, I do want to address one criticism I've gotten quite a bit lately. And when I do get constructive criticism, quite honestly, I I have to look in the mirror and say, now, wait a second, is this a valid criticism or not? And at times I've had to say, yeah, this is valid and actually implement and change something that I've been doing. But I did get one comment, and this has been common of a lot, a few comments I've gotten lately, which is John I really wish you wouldn't interrupt all of these ads with Mizzou football talk. Just kidding. I know you have to. Well, I guess this person was kidding because I responded and said, basically, you know, this is the cost of success, quite honestly. And they said, hey, all good. Enjoy the show, that kind of thing. But regardless, I'm going to be brutally honest. I've seen this criticism in my page a couple times, but that particular critique really just rolls 100% off my back because, number one, let's compare it to a a half hour of SportsCenter, 
for example, next time. And let me know the content versus advertising ratio and how it really compares to this podcast. Like, genuinely, really, go, go do it and tell me how it turns out. Secondly, as I've said before, maybe I haven't said it enough, there is an ad-free version on this show at Amazon Music. If you have Amazon Prime, for example, I'm pretty sure you have access to Amazon Music as well. So quite honestly, what else do you want from me at this point? So again, guys, it, the fact that there is ads in this show it's a it's a sign of success. The fact that you're hearing a lot of the same ads multiple times a week, a month, over the years. FanDuel's been with us for a long time, for example. There's a reason for that. It's because it's working, because this show and this network is working. So frankly, all of you who listen and watch, and especially those of you who've told a friend and fellow true sons and daughters and by God, Mizzou mafiosos as well about the program. I can't thank you enough because I'm having a blast. Hopefully you're having a blast as well. And until next time, I am John Miller, and thanks as always for listening to Locked on Mizzou.